All right, praise the Lord, everybody. Um, good evening, it's Wednesday, and uh, we are uh, the uh, 26th, I believe, of January, and uh, we're bringing to you uh, the uh, reading out of Jonathan Mitchell's New Testament, um, a Greek rendering, so we're uh, really thrilled about that tonight, and you're in the reading room. It's a uh, series of readings that uh, I felt led of the Lord to start so that we can come into the um, knowledge and the understanding of what the original language of the scripture really means. So um, that's what we have been doing now for several months. And uh, we're in Hebrews, the 10th chapter. Uh, we have finished the book of Romans, and it's for your viewing pleasure, both on Facebook and on our YouTube channel, The House of the Lord, Robert Taranjo. So um, uh, it's available for anyone that's uh, wanting to uh, learn more about uh, the Lord and about the scriptures themselves. Uh, so tonight, let's go ahead and just go to uh, the Lord in prayer. Ask the Lord to bless us tonight and to give us understanding. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you, Lord, for tonight's opportunity to come before you, to be in your presence with your saints. Lord, I thank you for this broadcast that's able to bring us all together at the same time, Lord, in you. And I thank you, Lord, for those who have uh, found the time to be able to uh, view with us and to be a part of this broadcast. I ask you, Lord, that you will anoint them with the Holy Ghost. I ask you, Lord, that their minds would be uh, operating out of the heavens, O God, that you would lift us up from the earthly understanding into the heavenly understanding of your word. I'm asking you, Lord, that you will peel back uh, the first layer and the second layer of your word, Lord, until we get to the third level spirit of truth of your scriptures. And Lord, I'm asking you, God, that your anointing will be upon us to do so. I'm asking you, Lord, for your help tonight as your messenger. I'm asking for your anointing to be upon me, for your word to be in my mouth, and oh God, for us to be able to expound on your word. Give us your understanding to give out and may it be assimilated into the lives of your people, and may they grow every day from these sessions, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for those that are walking so closely with you, who have such a hunger to be in the presence of the Lord. I'm asking you, Father, for your healing virtue to go into their bodies. I'm asking you, Father, that you will revive their spirit and, and restore their soul, that God, they will be presented a one whole new man before you, Lord. Uh, continue your dealings in our heart, Lord. Continue uh, your, your uh, process of bringing us into the way pointed out. And I'm asking you, Lord, for your grace to be ever present and that, God, we will continue uh, to obey you in all things. So we love you and appreciate you, Lord Jesus. Thank you tonight. Amen and amen. All right. As is my custom, I'm going to go back a few verses. We're in Hebrews 10. I believe we stopped at Hebrews 5. And we're going to start uh, from verse 1 and read quickly through the prior verses that we had read so that we can um, have a continuing thought on what uh, the writer has been writing down uh, to the uh, Hebrews. Amen. Uh, it says in the first verse, for the law holding a shadow of the impending good things, not the very image of or the same reproduced likeness from those transactions. In other words, it was a shadow, but not those actual uh, 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 transactions or uh, uh, um, 
figures themselves that were in the heavenlies. So uh, it says, holding a shadow of the impending good things, not the very image of or the same reproduced likeness from those transactions, continues not even once able at any point to perfect those folks repeatedly coming near by offering the same sacrifices every year on into the whole length of its existence. Never once would it be able to perfect the people uh, only once a year to have their sins forgiven through the uh, rituals of the priest, the chief priest. Verse 2 says, Otherwise, would they not cease being habitually offered? Because those constantly serving upon having once for all been cleansed would not still continue to have even one consciousness about sins. Third verse, but in contrast, in these folks, there is yearly a remembrance of sins. For you see, in the fourth verse, blood from bulls and from he goats is without ability and is powerless to be periodically carrying away sins. Now that was the prior verses that we had covered. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a, a, a stark contrast, isn't it? And I wonder if the Christians of today really understand the significance of Jesus dying for their sins. Now I told you uh, Monday night uh, and I made some pretty bold and blunt statements concerning sin. Jesus forgave you and the whole entire race of mankind. He, when he uh, died, he died for your sins, for everyone's sins, past, present, future. Uh, and yet, today, the, the, the Babylonian church system still preaches and makes it their, uh, one of their main uh, focus points in preaching is sin. And to be properly in the kingdom state of mind, we have to get beyond our sin consciousness. We have to get beyond the fact that we are missing the mark and uh, that we will continue to miss the mark until we have come into the full expression, nature, character, and essence of Jesus Christ. And for that reason, we don't stop shooting for the mark. We continue to gauge our progress in him by shooting toward the mark of the prize. Uh, and if we come short, then so be it. But every time we shoot, we should be getting closer and closer. And that will all depend upon our advancement in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. So we have a race before us. We have a goal in front of us. And we cannot condemn ourselves for missing the mark. Jesus has not come to condemn us for missing the mark. He has come to give us strength and righteousness and a new mind and a new nature in order to continue toward the goal. And, uh, uh, and that is what I think the Christian church never has gotten right from the scriptures. And from the Greek, we hopefully can start to get uh, a, a another perspective on how God looks at our failures and our uh, uh, our missing the mark. Uh, and for him, he understands because he has subjected us unto vanity. It was his subjection that made mankind vain and full of vanity. And, uh, and, and he has the answer for it. And 2,000 years ago, the answer came. And the answer went to a cross 
bled and gave up the ghost, was buried in a tomb, and on the third day he arose. And at that time, it extended to all souls, both those souls that have been born already and those souls that are being born and those souls that are yet to be born. It was a universal uh, Eonian for all the ages uh, sacrifice that brought us into uprightness in God through Jesus Christ, not according to our own works, but according to his righteousness. Now, Israel could not uh, have that perspective because they were operating out of a system an arrangement of an old covenant, of the first covenant. And so they could not look unto Jesus and see into Jesus what you and I have been brought into access for now. So uh, I think spontaneous praise comes out of us every time we should think about that. We should be uh, so thankful and so uh, uh, grateful for God's gift. Amen. And, uh, uh, and, and tonight, I want to emphasize that, that this is in contrast to this yearly um, um, ritual of blood sacrifice uh, that could own, uh, of a beast at that. The priest could not, did not even shed his own blood. He brought the blood of a beast into the Holy of Holies and offered it unto God as a sacrifice for the people of Israel each year. Now our high priest has done it once and for all. Hallelujah. And, and for that, we serve him. For that, we give him our life. For that, we fall in love with him over and over and over again. Hallelujah. Because of his wondrous grace towards us, that he would, that he himself would leave the glory that he was born into, uh, the place in God uh, where he was uh, the very offspring of God. And God actually brought forth a son so that he could deliver and save and make free and glorify and give eternal life to a lowly creature named man that the angels themselves, I know, uh, look upon as, why that? <laughs> why that? Why would you do all of this for that weak, unable, sinful, corruptible creature? But that is the nature of God. I believe the nature of God is to take the unbreakable, I mean to take the unlovable and the uh, broken creature, a creature that is less than, uh, and then to have a plan drawn out where this, this lowly, lower than the angels, lowly dust creature made out of the dust, he can take that, lost cause and bring it and make it into his very own. Hallelujah. So it's a wondrous story of the scriptures and I never get tired of thinking on it and telling you about it because it is the, the greatest love story ever told. The love of God for mankind. So now in the fifth verse, let's continue reading here. I wanted to read all the other four verses because we have a wherefore. And whenever you read a wherefore, you've got to say, wherefore, where'd that come from? What, what's it saying about wherefore? And so we just found out what that is. Wherefore, or because of which, repeatedly, habitually, continually, periodically or presently coming into the system or entering the cosmos and the world of religion, culture, secular society, and government, 
I told you before, everything that God has created is a system. It has a beginning and it has an end. And it has a, um, a, a process involved in it. It, it, it has uh, within it this uh, uh, something that you can readily recognize that the reason for the system is to produce something. And, and that is in, in the instance of the world and of culture and of global economy and of religion and of every other thing you can mention, it is a system that God himself has either instituted or he has allowed man to institute his system. But it's all systems. The uh, Greek many times refers to it as a sphere. And that's a popular Greek expression in the scriptures. The breath effect, the God's sphere, which contains the breath effect of God. The, the, uh, br the, the, um, uh, the system or breath effect or sphere of Jesus Christ. And that is what we are being brought into uh, in this process, we are moving from our sphere, and all of us have a sphere that we've created, our world, our sphere, and that is what we know most about, our five sense realm sphere. And we know how to get along in that sphere. Uh, and we know how to manipulate that sphere. But now we are leaving that sphere and we're coming into the system or the sphere of Jesus Christ and of his kingdom. Hallelujah. So now we are learning a new way of living. Glory. We are now learning a new way to relate to God without manipulating God, without trying to get God in a headlock. And I, I see people do that all the time. They, uh, when they pray, uh, a lot of people will tell God and quote him scripture. <laughs> they will <laughs> quote him scripture. I know why we do, because we think, well, I got to remind you about this, God, because you might have forgotten what the scripture says. And we do it out of a pure heart. But the fact of the matter is, God doesn't need to have us telling him the scriptures, <laughs> Glory to God. He already knows the scriptures. He, he wrote them for crying out loud. So uh, the more we grow in God, the less we try to manipulate him. The, the less that we try to work our way into his good graces like as though he will some way or another, we will be able to change the mind of God about something. And... Uh, and, and we are learning every day greater and greater how to be real in God. Uh, Pentecost and Passover has been so much about the mask, thinking that they're going to be able to hide from God, thinking that God doesn't really know how bad they are. God doesn't really know what kind of thoughts they've got. Uh, how they're thinking they've got the short end of the stick and everybody outside of the church is getting having all the fun and they don't want to admit that to God so they hide behind things. They have all these walls of defense up uh, so, that God, so that they can't come face to face with God naked as they are. They, they present themselves differently with God. They, they clothe themselves, the scripture says, in a robe of self-righteousness. Uh, they don't want to be naked, so they, they try to convince God that they're better than what maybe he thinks they are. You know, I've done a lot of good things for you, Lord. I, 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 I've, I've given this amount of money, and, and I, I, you know, I did take that dinner down to my neighbor when they were sick and gave them some chicken soup and baked a cake for the pastor. And, uh, and they're always thinking about 
how to be able to manipulate God to give them what they want. And in their mindset, they are still thinking, you know, I don't deserve this. I don't deserve a, a heaven and I've got to find a way to get into it. And you know what? They're right. None of us deserve it. But that's what this, dear ones, is all about. We need to accept what Jesus has done. Uh, totally accept it. Not try to add to it. Not try to put our own work into it. Uh, he is not holding against you anything. In fact, he is trying to work with you in every way possible to bring you out of that state of mind and to lift you up and elevate your thoughts, elevate your thinking into a position where you accept everything that God has done for you with a willing heart. Hallelujah. Without thinking, well, he's given me that, so I've got to give him something back. God doesn't do tit for tat. God doesn't give and then say, now give me back. God gives, period. He gives and he gives and he gives. But he, he knows his plan for you. And he knows that as he gives into you, that bread that he casts upon your waters will not return void to him. He knows that the investment that he has invested in you is going to bring a return back unto him, not of some kind of a work of the flesh, but of a people, of a people who were not a people, a church that was not a church. Hallelujah. Those that had uh, once been so forlorn and undone, and now he sees before him a people who are willingly offering up praises and worship in his name without the threat of hell over their head, without the threat of God uh, annihilating them. But they have come to receive their inheritance that he, he has purchased for them without cost. Hallelujah. And now they are starting to live in the reality of that inheritance. They, they have died to the old sphere, and they are starting to re be reborn and remade and remodeled and, and, and reconstituted in the sphere of Jesus Christ and all the glory that he represents. Amen. So getting back to the fifth verse, all that was free. Hallelujah. Wherefore, repeatedly coming into the system or entering the cosmos and the world of religion, culture, secular society, and government, he is saying, you do not will or purpose or intend sacrifice and offering, but you completely equipped, thoroughly adjusted down, put in order, knit together in and for yourself a body, for and in me. And of course, in King James, uh, that is uh, said this way. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared for me. The system, the uh, cosmos, the world of religion, that is where the Greek uh, has been translated by King James into when he cometh into the world. But the Greek goes far into what is the world? What do we mean by world? And that's where it starts to give us clues of systems within systems. Hallelujah. That everything is spheres within spheres within spheres. Glory to God. And it's always in God multi-layered. Uh, uh, you see that in Paul being called up to the third heavens. God layers things. First heaven, second heaven, third heaven, who knows? Fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh heaven. Who knows? Uh, maybe. 
<laughs> As we heard Sunday from Zach, maybe 7, 12, 120, I don't know. But you can see from that, right, that that's how God works, layers things upon each other, upon each other, upon each other. So there's never just one thing in God. It's always interreacting, interrelating to one another. So I love the way the Greek says it. You do not will, purpose or intend, sacrifice and offering, but you completely equipped, thoroughly adjusted down, put in order, knit together in and for yourself a body for and in me. Sixth verse says, and the results and effects of whole burnt offerings about sin concerning failure to hit the target, you did not think well of or have a good opinion about. Then I said, consider, I am arriving to do your will, to make, form, create, produce, perform your will. Isn't that what we should hear and understand and isn't that what we should try our best to initiate? Not just to know the will, to do the will of God. Hallelujah. Uh, it's not enough just to uh, know what his will is concerning humanity. Now we are personally involved. Those of us that have gone through the many transformations throughout the path that we have been on, going from Passover to Pentecost and now into Tabernacles, it is unto us to where we can say, okay, I am now personally involved in this. It's not just a religion anymore. Religion talks about God uh, as though he's not there. But the real walk in Jesus Christ is a personal investment in it now. We're not hirelings, right? We, we are under shepherds in Christ. We are invested in this. We are a part of ownership. <laughs> Glory. We are not uh, hourly workers anymore, working a certain amount of hours and then going home off the job. Uh, we are owners of a business of God, and, and we, uh, as a result, uh, we put in as much time as is necessary, right? Every owner has to do that. Sometimes owners wish they were on hourly so that they can go home and forget about it. But owners don't do that. Owners are personally invested, and uh, if you're going to be a successful owner, you put as many hours into getting that business to be successful as it takes. You're not thinking hourly. You're thinking end result. Glory to God. And that's where um, uh, we as sons of God, of the business of God, we are thinking results. We are thinking ahead to say, okay, uh, this is going to be what it's going to take in order to bring the kingdom of God into the earth in full expression. It's going to take a people who no longer view themselves as followers, but now they are starting to see themselves as those who are a part of the administration of the kingdom of God which is totally different than being subjects of the kingdom of God. Do you see that? Totally different to be in the administrative part than it is to be those who are receiving the benefits of being subjects of such a great king. But we have been called to come into the administrative part of God's government so that now we have to know all facets of the kingdom. We have to know uh, everything that, that involves uh, the subjects, involves the government itself. We have to have a full 
knowledge and comprehension of what it takes in order for the kingdom to function and what must be done in order to bring it into that function. And so we enter into a, uh, a, a co-op with God where he is showing us the business and he is enabling us to become part of the business. I hope you're getting this. I hope you're hearing it with your spirit, dear ones. This is the difference between being a Christian and a son of God. Because now as sons of God, everything that entitlement speaks about, son, family, offspring, uh, heir, joint heir, all of that says you cannot think anymore like a ditch digger, like a servant. Now you have been under tutors and governors, even though you were a son, I had to put you under tutors and governors until a time appointed. And then at that time appointed, I moved you out from under those tutors and governors and I brought you into my throne. Hallelujah. That's the seriousness of this day and that's why we're not playing the games of church anymore. That's why we're not sparing uh, anyone of knowing the real truth about what the doctrines of Babylon speak and what kingdom truth and reality speak. Hallelujah. Uh, we're not children anymore. We, 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 we must now put away childish things and we have to come into a mature, not toys anymore, into mature elements of God that have the power. Oh God, let me say this where you can hear it. Those elements that we're coming into now have consequence. Used to be a servant, no matter if he did right or wrong, it wouldn't affect the kingdom, would it? It would affect him personally and maybe his family. Maybe his friends, maybe. But it wouldn't go into all the kingdom. But this, now being a part of the governmental realm of Christ, now that we realize the son's sonship is more than just, hey, I'm a son, glory. Everybody look at me, I'm a son. It involves consequence in everything we say and do. So now if I uh, give way to my lower nature, and if I say or do harmful things in the name of God, that is going to have far greater consequence now. It is going to be far reaching. And I will be held in judgment in God if I don't, if I don't adhere myself to the fact that there is now in me the power of life and death. So God forbid us ministering death, condemnation, judgment, un unrighteous judgment. God forbid us of using the word of God in any way to bring harm to anyone. Because as uh, uh, Jesus said, it's, uh, uh, it was used in, in children, but everybody's children when it comes to the government of God uh, but he said, if you offend one of these little ones, it would be better for you that you would have a millstone tied around your neck and cast into the sea. He was trying to make them aware, this is no little thing. This is no little thing. This is a very important thing. And take heed, lest you find yourself in that kind of judgment. Amen. And I don't think we're high up above all of that. I think it also can be said unto you and I, especially unto you and I, who are have come to believe that we are that which the scriptures say we are. Hallelujah. 
uh, seventh verse, then I said, consider, I am arriving to do your will, O God. In a little head of a scroll, a summary of a little scroll, it has been written concerning me. And that's that uh, famous verse in verse seven in the King James that says, then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. Uh, eighth verse says, up above, in saying that you do not will, purpose, or intend, neither think well of or approve sacrifice and offering and the result and effect of whole burnt offerings, even concerning sin, failure, error offerings, which things down from and in accord with law and custom continue being repeatedly offered. And I remind you again of what I said Monday night. At the time of this writing, uh, the uh, priesthood was alive and well. They were doing all of these very things in the temple. Some of the Christians were still going to the temple because they were young in the faith and they still hung on to their Jewishness. They still hung on to the law and that's the very reason why Paul, who I believe wrote this, is making a point to tell them, you no longer owe allegiance to that. That is a dead end. We have received all of that in Christ Jesus our Lord. And it is a greater, superior, more excellent agreement and arrangement that we have with Jesus than what Moses instituted under the law. Hallelujah. Um, he then said in the ninth verse, consider, I am arriving to do your will, O God, to form, make, and create your will, your purpose, intent, resolve, O God, he is habitually or progressively or presently taking back up the first so that he could make the second to stand. Hallelujah. Or that he may place and establish the second. We have this interplay in the Greek about the first and the second. The first tabernacle and the second tabernacle. And they are, and Jesus is constantly having to, or the writers having, having to constantly show that Jesus, while his priesthood was present during the uh, Levitical priesthood, uh, it was not fully manifested, but rather was in the holiest of all, the holy of holy folks, holy things, holy elements, all of the holy place was holy. The whole tabernacle was holy, but the second tabernacle was the holiest of everything else that in and of itself was holy. So can you see why God is wanting to make sure that you and I are ready to be ministers of the second tabernacle because we have to have within us that divine uh, image and likeness operating. We have to be more than human. We have to be divine in him. Hallelujah. So uh, for a people who uh, were at one time strangers and without God and subject to the darkness of this world and walked according to the course of this world and fully participated in the, in the shortcomings of the world, can you imagine that God brings a people from that and brings them out from that 
by a process of continually appearing unto them. Continually, time after time after time, giving them opportunity to come to know their God. And that's the way it was with you and I. Uh, we didn't just come to God like that, even though it seems like that may be for some. But God has been working on us since our mother's womb. He has been preparing us for such a time as this. Glory to God. It's heavy, isn't it? Praise the Lord. It's not David slaying Goliath uh, or any other of the Old Testament stories. Uh, it is truly being drawn behind the veil face to face with God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And it, and, and it is something that uh, is, is uh, fearful to be involved in. And yet we must, because if we don't, then uh, who will appear to the nations with Jesus Christ, if not those that he has chosen? And he won't allow that to happen. Amen. Uh, where was I? Um, I'll just read it, the eighth verse. Up above in saying that you do not will, neither think well of or approve sacrifice and offering and the result and effect of whole burnt offerings, even concerning sin offerings, which things down from and in accord with law and custom continue being repeatedly offered, even as he wrote. He then said, consider, I am arriving to do your will, O God. He is habitually or progressively or presently taking back up the first so that he could make the second to stand or that he may place and establish the second. Within which will or in union with which intent and purpose, we are folks having been made set apart once. Get over that, please. Stop thinking that, well, God has just left me all alone. I know many of us feel we're all alone. Many of us feel that, uh, and I get so many uh, phone calls and emails uh, and texts from some that uh, they feel so alone. They don't have people to talk with, to fellowship with, uh, and they say that we're a lifeline for them on these broadcasts because they don't have anywhere else to get a confirmation from, and that uh, they can, I just heard from someone from West Virginia who has been listening to our broadcast since 2020 and felt impelled that it was time now to let me know. <laughs> that she had been listening and viewing and it had changed her life. That she used to just get newsletters from Brother Eby and was kept in her life and, and she said that she had uh, read in those years, she had read his articles and that he would quote me every once in a while, Bob Taranjo. And she said, so I finally said, I've got to see what this Bob guy is about. <laughs> if Preston's quoting him, maybe he's someone that I can receive from too. Because she didn't want to just receive from something, you know, less than. Uh, she knew Preston's writings were top notch. Truly the word of the Lord. And she didn't want to just go out and get tied up in something else. So she tried it out and she saw that I was on Facebook and she said that she started listening to broadcasts and she has been praising the Lord ever since. Hallelujah. But I don't want people to think that, oh, God has left me alone. We are all alone in that sense. I am not a part of a huge minister's fellowship. Uh, it's getting smaller by the day <laughs> of, of, of who we can fellowship. And, uh, and the fact is, <laughs> the fact is 
that we're all alone. But that doesn't dismay us, dear ones. For one thing, we have Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah, we have Jesus. Does that mean then that if we're in loneliness, we've got to become closer to him and more responsive to him? Does he be, need to become more real to us? No doubt. No doubt we need to have the Lord become more real to us. But at the same time, that is a uh, the fact that you have not taken it upon yourself to go back to a church that has got numbers and fellowship and friends, the fact that you have not felt in your spirit to go back to that means that you are set apart by God. And that means, dear ones, that you are holy under the Lord, sanctified under the Lord, something that is precious in the eyes of the Lord. You're marked for a high calling of the prize in Christ Jesus. Glory, hallelujah. And so uh, whenever I hear that, I understand lowliness. Believe me, I understand it. But we uh, thank God for these broadcasts. Thank God for the newsletters. Thank God for the CDs that we send out. Thank God for the music CDs that we can play over and over again that lift our spirit up and keep us uh, 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 connected to the to the, uh, to the heavens of God. So uh, he's saying to these, we are folks having been made set apart ones, sanctified folks, sacred and holy people through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. You know, a lot of times we say once and for all, but that's not really the right phrase because that seems to think uh, once and for all, just talking about time-wise. This is this just once and now it won't all be offered again. But, the, but this statement, uh, once for all, not once and for all, he was offered up once for all peoples, all humanity, hallelujah, amen. And, and, and again, as I told you about the Greek, don't speed read it. Read it and then consider it. Amen. Because there are nuggets like these that I just brought out once for all. It means so much di difference than once and for all. These are nuggets that every time you find a nugget, uh, you want to search it out because it may lead you to a vein of gold. Amen. If there's a nugget laying on the ground, it came from a vein. And so uh, uh, gold diggers will look for that and they will search out until they find the vein that it came from. These are nuggets. So don't just let them lay Pick them up, examine them, and search them out because this will open up all kinds of other wonderful things if you do that. Uh, 11th verse says, And so, indeed, on the one hand, every priest has stood daily publicly serving and offering the same sacrifices many times and repetition uh, oh my goodness. Um, I hear some ministers, and I'm, I'll just tell you the truth. I have to be honest about it. They say the same things over and over and over again. And it's like they're stuck. It's like those, uh, I, I know uh, most of you, uh, you younger folks may not even know what this is like, but my wife and I do. And, uh, and, and many of you that are uh, as old or even a little younger than us will realize, uh, a record player. Uh, if you were of my uh, age, then you'll know that when you'd play a record and the needle would move across on the grooves of the record, when it'd get to the end, it would 
just stay there over and over. And you'd have to pick the needle up and put it either in its holder or put it back at the beginning of the record. Uh, and that's what it sounds like to me when I hear people minister that have no fresh bread. It's just old bread being presented as something new. You can only dress up the old uh, so many different ways before people start realizing, you know what, that looks like the same thing they had here last week. <laughs> it's just got a different pair of pants on it and maybe a, a different color shirt, but looks like the same thing that we've been saying for the past 50 years. So now we're getting fresh bread that God is speaking to us in this day. And we are starting to uh, have a well-rounded word, meaning that it's not a one-note message that we have. Reconciliation, 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 reconciliation. That's that needle stuck. Reconciliation. Sonship, 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 sonship. We, we, we are now, God is, again, because it is a governmental realm we're being called to, now God is wanting us to have a full ministry. A ministry that knows all the different levels of the kingdom, that can administrate his blessings and his life into every level as God sees fit. But first of all, we have to be all that. Amen. Uh, and and that's, that's where I believe that, that God is getting ready to turn every, everything upside down for those that are just hanging on to the old and not willing to allow God to bring freshness to us. Hallelujah. Um, so we are folks having been made set apart ones. So it says, and so indeed on the one hand, every priest has stood daily, publicly serving and offering the same sacrifices many times or often, which things not even once, never, are able or have power to take away sins, failures, errors, which surround or envelop us. Yet on the other hand, I love that phrase. I love it every time it comes up. Yet on the other hand, this one, after, after at one point offering one sacrifice, is talking about Jesus, stretched for the whole length over the situation of sins or on behalf of failures and errors sat within the right side of God or at the right hand of God centered in God's place of power, honor, and acceptance on into the whole length or extended into the unbroken context continuance. These other priests of, of, uh, of, of the uh, Aaronic priesthood, they kept going over and over and over the same thing, the same methodology, and, and still not being able to take away any sin. Uh, but this one, Jesus, uh, once... Uh, he offered his sacrifice, and that stretched for the whole length. Sins past, sins present, sins in the future. Do you get that? That's how far it stretched without ever having to offer himself again. He did it, completed it, and perfected it for all time, for all men everywhere. Hallelujah. Continuously, one after another in the 13th verse, taking hold with the hand to embrace and welcome 
from out of the rest, the remaining and leftover, until the hated ones that belong to him, his enemies, they belong to him, the ruiners that he has. This is opening up a whole nother thing for us, isn't it? Jesus owns everything. And uh, they belong to him. Those that spit in uh, uh, Adam, those that curse his name, those that refuse to believe upon him, those that make it their personal quest to tear everything down about him. Hallelujah. Uh, This sacrifice uh, has come to be for all of that. And he has entered into this rest until all of this, the, his enemies, the ruiners that he has, folks who are hostile in relation to him can be placed as a footstool of his feet. Now, this is uh, what that Greek would mean, would be set in a humble and supportive position in relation to his body. I'm going to stop here would be set in a humble and supportive position in relation to his body. You know how uh, how Christians would look at that, religious Christians? Yeah, and God's going to make them my footstool, and I'm going to stand on their neck, and they're going to be subjected to me. The Greek says it so much differently than that and gives us the true nature of Jesus so that they would be a footstool of his feet, would be set in a humble and supportive position in relation to his body. They they would actually, from trying to tear him down, they would be in a humble and supportive position unto him. Hallelujah. Giving his feet rest. Hallelujah. Isn't that wonderful? And, and it's so different than what the Christian uh, nature is of religiosity. Glory to God. So let's learn from this, folks. Everything that is against us will one day be for us. Everything right now that God is allowing to work against you will come to the day that it will be working for you. Simply because that is the nature of God. Amen. I hope you've enjoyed tonight. I hope you've received something from the Lord that you can walk in. These are things that we can walk in, dear ones. These are things that every day we can say, Lord, I'm gonna, I am going to practice that in my life. I am going to do my utmost to be able to make that a reality in my life. Amen? Amen. So uh, let's do that uh, this week. Let's walk in these principles that have been spelled out here. Uh, Let God bring you out from the uh, consciousness of sin so that you're no longer walking around uh, feeling badly or trying to earn your way because you have been so uh, unappreciative of God. Uh, you keep failing and failing and failing. Well, the fact is, is that we are going to be brought forth one day into perfection. That's what perfection is. Did you know that salvation means the end of all deliverance? Salvation is when you come to the end of all deliverance. There's not a single throne left standing within you that has opposed God. (laughs) hallelujah hallelujah that is our blessed hope that is what causes us to uh, to go on and, and, and to become even more thrilled every day with what God is doing in us he is uh bringing down the kingdoms of men and the kingdoms of a religious com- uh, uh, mindset and he is building up the kingdom of God within us. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, we love you tonight, and we appreciate you, and thank God for you. Uh, we, uh, we, we do have many friends 
uh, that are watching the broadcast, that are writing to us, uh, we really and truthfully are a part of a family of God, and we thank God for you. Amen. Uh, if you want to write to us, write at P.O. Box 0519, Dixon, Tennessee, 37056. Amen. And I love the letters that have testimonies in them. I love the letters that have prayer uh, requests in them. Uh, we take all of that very seriously. And any offerings that come in, I pray over every one of them. I ask the Lord to, to bless the one that sends it so that uh, they can continue to see the blessings of the Lord in their life and uh, that, that they would know that they're having an effect by those offerings. Amen. So we thank you and we appreciate you in the Lord. Now let's ask God to seal this up in us. Lord, I'm asking you, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will seal the word of truth in our hearts and minds. That, Lord, will be brought to our remembrance as we most need it at that time. That your word will continue to be alive and and quicken us by the life in it. Lord, we thank you for all that we just read about how superior and greater, oh God, is your agreement with us. Hallelujah. Then the former agreement. We thank you, Lord, that you have uh, given us all things and that all things are in our hands, Lord. And I'm asking you, Lord, that you will uh, move upon your people, upon their needs, Lord. We're a needy people today. Uh, the, the COVID virus is still affecting so many, so many. And we're asking you to keep your hands upon us, asking you, Lord, that you will allow us to walk through the valley of the shadow of death without fear, knowing that you are with us. Amen and that you comfort us throughout the times, even when those uh, uh, that are, are contracting the virus, we're laying them in your hands, Lord. And we're believing you, Lord, to be the advocate for them and work on their behalf to bring them out of such a physical illness. And we're asking you, Lord, that you will bless us financially, physically, mentally, emotionally, in every which way, that this word will truly minister to the whole man that stands before you, Lord. So we thank you for all that you have done and all that you're doing, and we thank you for all that you're going to do. In your holy name we pray, amen and amen. God bless you. We love you. Praise the Lord.